Hello, and welcome to Generational Archives. And I'm Dr. Raina J. Leon, and I'm one of your co-hosts. I'm so happy to welcome you again. I hope that you've been listening along the way when we've been traveling with to Western Pennsylvania and to South Carolina and the most intimate, the personal story, the binders, and as well as extending beyond. So I'm with my mother, Dr. Norma D. Thomas. Mommy, how are you going to introduce yourself today? Hello, and I'm just glad to be with you. I'm glad to look up and still see sky. <laughs> yes, I am also very glad for that. Um, so we're going to start with our check-in today, which is so what is a musical shaping influence for you, Mommy? Well, it took me a minute before I came up with something, but for my generation, of course, we were the Motown generation, but one of the revolutionary pieces of music was Marvin Gaye's What's Going On that addressed the issues of the Vietnam War and what was going on in the country at that period of time. The other was James Brown, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, mm. which v voiced what so many of us were feeling at the time, but no one had quite said it in music before. And both of those songs talk about what I heard someone talk about yesterday, and that is that all of us have a role to play in our activism and changing the world. So artists do it in their way. The creatives do it in their way. Mm -hmm. And the, even if they're not the ones on the front line protesting, they can be protesting in their own way and it being so effective. I can just remember playing Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud everywhere I could play that song. On buses going to school games when we were going out of town, it just said so much for the people of my generation that he would put himself on the line to do that. And I actually saw James Brown in person where people started fighting. James Brown came to the stage, said, if you don't stop now, I will leave. And it was peaceful for the rest of that concert. Mm, yeah. I, I thought I was going to say the Lemonade album, and it was a, also a musical film from Beyonce, just because of the extension of the musical form into these mini films that themselves were in relationship to one another and her expressed devotion to black women and the centering of our stories and also the connection of our stories within natural spaces um, and creating a space as well for the expression of rage. And I, I loved those, um, those notes within the Lemonade album. And before we were talking, I was like, oh, I also want to talk about that, that poignant moment of being, you know, 18 and the album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill, or just about that age, comes out and seeing her in concert and how incredible that that moment was to see an artist with all of these um, explorations of different forms, as well as an eye towards um, injustice too within her work and, and to see her on the stage and also talk about mothering. Uh, I didn't know that then, but to explicitly talk about the, how the world around her wanted a very different path for her, which was, did not include mothering and how she chose to actually become a mother. And so I thought I would be talking about um, those. But then you mentioned uh, James Brown, and you mentioned especially the concert, and I thought about a similar experience, as, s experience with Erica Badu, and I've seen her many times in concert, and I just have always loved her vibe um, and how folks can just ride into cosmic places, spirit places, um, uh, Erica Badu is elemental and she's also real strange and I love that. <laughs> like, there's this uh, clip on, I, I want to say I saw it on like TikTok or something of her sounding so disappointed about how, you know, I just don't know what I have to do. I, 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 I do this and I do that. I, do, I just don't know why the aliens won't abduct me. And she was serious. Like it's, it <laughs> felt real serious. She was so disappointed. She had done all the things you could possibly do to gather their attention and 
still they had not abducted her <laughs> so i love that i love the exploration of the fantastical and the grounded and the spiritual and the cosmological and the connected as well as um uh justice work and transformation work it's all in there and i think that perhaps those three women artists do that for me with erica badu she did a recent interview where she said she hadn't put out a new album in about 10 years but she could still sell out concerts mm. so that's amazing yeah that's amazing that's amazing it speaks to the to the connection to the audience and that that new neo soul vibe continues right um so let's get into what we're talking about today which is what mommy what are we talking about well, in the continuation of the process for discovery about your history, we said we were, you should start with yourself. So there is a segment that I talk about who I am as a person and some of my history. And so I thought we should continue that with talking about my siblings. Because most of them are still living, we won't give but so much specific details, but it talks about their story. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be a good place for us to begin and for you to begin in terms of talking to those people who are still around and asking them about their story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really excited to hear some stories that perhaps I have not heard before. So where do you want to begin? How many siblings do you have? Well, there were six siblings. There were six uh, girls all together and one boy. So that's how many of us there were. And I, this is Western Pennsylvania, this is Uniontown, and describe growing up together because you didn't know that you had so many siblings all your life. Well, there were six of us that grew up together, and we'll tell more about that story in a minute, but we grew up in a house that my father built, on uh, land that my father bought, he always said the house was old when it was built because it was made out of reclaimed lumber and any place that they could find wood. So it was old when they built, he and my grandfather built the house. Thankfully, they built it with a bathroom because we were the only ones over that hill that had a bathroom. Everyone else had an outhouse. And I, part of my cousin's chores w w were to go and empty the outhouse. And trust me, that was not pleasant to do that, empty that out, that slop bucket in the house to take it to the outhouse every evening. Yuck. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and so it was a two bedroom house. Two bedroom house. We, all the, the children were in one bedroom. So bunk beds, doubled up in beds. And it wasn't until my brother was older that they moved him to the basement. So at some point, he was happy because he had his own space in the basement, even though the basement wasn't the greatest place because it wasn't what you would call a finished basement. Well, and the basement, weren't there chores about keeping the heat on, the furnace going? Well, we had a coal stove. And so all the chores in the house were split up. And by week and so this week you had the task of making sure the fire didn't go out in the stove and if you did then you had to be the one to start the fire so you'd have to start with the the newspaper and then the wood and then and going and building that fire out and that was not that could be a dangerous activity depending on what you put in to begin that fire because I had blowback a few times mm. from what we put, what I put in to start the fire. But that was your job because if you let it go out, you had to build it back up again. So you said that part of the story was that six of you grew up together, but there were seven of you. So what is the story there? Well, my sister, Thelma Renee, has an interesting history. If you, if you heard the episode with my mother, Queen Esther Thomas, who was Queen Esther Satterwhite Nicholson Thomas, then my sister Renee's story is fairly similar. My, uh, my sister was born before my parents got married. She, her father is different. She was raised by the same aunt and uncle who raised my mother. 
And when my parents met and got married, my father very much wanted to bring Renee to the North. He was convinced by the aunt who was raising uh, my sister that it would be better for her to stay with them. And so for, mo for her life, she grew up down South. We did not know we had another sister until maybe I was nine, she was 11. And it, be it developed because she questioned why she was being introduced. It finally dawned on her that she was being introduced as a granddaughter, not a daughter. And that's when she started to ask questions about why am I being introduced as a granddaughter and not daughter. We got the word about the same time that we had this sister. So I vaguely remember going down south in the 60s that we took a trip down south. And I remember this because I was terrified, just terrified, because of all the news stories that you heard about the South. And I was terrified we wouldn't be able to eat on this long trip. Imagine six children and parents in a car. So we were all in one car together, no seat belts, no <laughs> the car seats, no nothing. And but terrified, where would we go to the bathroom? Because I heard about this whole thing with you, you could only go to certain bathrooms. Where would we eat? Would we be attacked on the way? So I remember being terrified the whole way down. And I vaguely remember my sister taking us around the neighborhood. But we did not see her again until I came home from break at Penn State. So I was at college and came home for Thanksgiving because her, her son was also asking questions about who his grandparents were, and he wanted to meet his grandmother. And so that prompted this trip to Uniontown, Pennsylvania. And from the moment we all met, you would not have ever thought we didn't grow up together. Mm -hmm. Our stories were different, but we instantly bonded as this is our older sister, even though in my household for my whole life, I was considered the oldest. So we knew we had a sister early on, but the, the back and forth, we didn't have a lot. She would write my mother and we would read the letters. And so we had some communication, but until she made that trip with her husband and son, to Uniontown, Pennsylvania, that was the first time we all hung out together and have been close, very close ever since. Her story is similar to other stories we talked about because one of the things I did in preparing and pulling together information about the family, as we said, you start with yourself and you start moving outward. I asked all of them for their birth certificates and their children's birth certificates mm -hmm. because it was important to have those legal documents. Well, my sister's birth certificate is also a delayed birth certificate. I can't remember why she needed to get an official birth record because Renee was actually born in New York, but that's not what her birth certificate says or her delayed certificate. It has her born in Richland County, Virginia, which is Columbia. And Richland uh, County, Virginia. Oh, Richland County, I'm sorry, Rich, Richland County, South Carolina, and that's um, uh, Columbia. So it has her born in Columbia. It has the verification for her being born in Columbia and and she needed that certificate. So again, if you went back and tried to find this official record, it is not the original birth certificate. It's yeah. so fascinating to me how birth certificates consistently, you think that they are pretty solid and they can be fluid too. So what we're learning here is like to even question the birth certificate because there might be a story in there too. And one thing I want to note is that all my siblings but me have only one child. And I swear I'd not have any children because when my siblings were, were little, I was always charged with watching them, cooking for them, 
driving them around. And I said, when I get older, I'm not having any kids. Well, and I I'm the only one with two. Didn't grandma actually tell you or somebody in the family, like, anybody can have children. Do something different. Like <laughs> my, my mother was very adamant that she had seven. My, my aunt had seven. And she said back in her time, women were expected to get married and have children. But but we didn't have to live up to that expectation. We could be anything we wanted to be. Anybody could have children. So she was not encouraging of us to have a, a lot of children. And so there aren't that many grandchildren, great-grandchildren on my side of the family. Yeah, there. This, I remember that story because it actually appears as a poem in my first book, In Canical mm -hmm. of Idols, yeah. So... That is my sister Renee, and so we've talked about me in another es episode. The next person to talk about would be my sister Faith. And Faith is a year younger than I am. She retired just a few years ago. Her career was in nursing. She worked in a hospital in Philadelphia for most of her career, but she's also retired military from the Navy, and there are a number of Navy retired folks in my family. And I always get her rank messed up, so I won't give you her rank, but let's put it this way. If she were to go on the naval base, a whole lot of people would be saluting my sister. So she retired as a reservist and is um, uh, very much still attuned to the military and the military life. And, but she was a, a nurse, career nurse for many, many years. Any questions you have? So as I recall the story, not so much a question, but as I recall the story, you and Faith were really close in age and so close that you actually shared a, a bunk in the bed or a bed in the bunk. Is that right? That's true. And as I recall that you, you yourself didn't spend all of your growing up years in Western Pennsylvania and in, in um, Uniontown, that you also went to Ohio at one point. And how old were you around then? If I recall correctly, I was five. And so we were just thinking about that. That would have been around the time that the twins, um, Philip and Phyllis, um, Uncle Stanley and uh, Aunt Stacy, were born. And but Faith didn't go with you. And so you went to Ohio with Nana Sarah, my my grandmother's mother, um, and then um, stayed there for how many years? Stay there for two years. And so I, I, I was trying to figure out like the timing of that because the twins, Uncle Staley and Aunt Stacy, they were not supposed to be twins. They <laughs> were a surprise as I remember the story. They were. So let's talk about me going to Ohio. I, my, my mother's mother, birth mother, moved to Ohio at some point, lived relatively close to us, about three hours away. So we saw her frequently. I went to Ohio. I don't think originally I was supposed to stay as long as I did, but I went to Ohio. I started kindergarten early, so when I went to another state, I had to repeat kindergarten. That's why I think it was five, because I started at four, and then stayed through first grade. My grandmother made the mistake of telling my mother that she was preparing for my college education. <laughs> And as soon as she told my dad that, they were in the car and came to get me because my dad said what happened to my mother being raised by somebody else and my sister being raised by somebody else that he was not going to have that pattern repeat and he came to get me. My, my grandmother was totally devastated because this was her opportunity to raise a child, but I was the most happy person that could have ever been that I was now going home because when they would come to see me and leave, I would sit in the picture window and cry and cry. And I had my own room and I had books and I had toys and I had anything I could have wanted. All I wanted was to go home. Yeah. All I wanted was to go home. So I went back home and spent you know, the rest of the time until I graduated in Western Pennsylvania. I also love that 
you say, oh, I had my own room, I had all these toys, I had everything that I could want, but I wanted to go home. And home was a two-bedroom, um, old when it was made house, made by my grandfather's hands. But when you talk about the adventures that you had with your cousins growing up in Uniontown, there's so much delight and love and celebration. And I don't know how we survived, but we did with all the antics that you um, got into with my aunts and uncle and my um, my um, extended cousins and so on. So it sounds like a vibrantly alive and pretty independent place, too. Well, I have to say, and I always say this, I don't know where my parents were, <laughs> given some of the stuff we used to do over that hill, and that I am very happy that we survived. It was all in play. We they put us out in the morning and we would play in the woods. We play we lived at the base of what was then two very large hills before it was graded downward to put in pavement because they were dirt roads. And we did all kinds of stuff and had the best time. But I'm you know, there were no such things as helmets and knee pads and elbow pads and all those things. And we didn't come back in until it was time to go to bed. So I don't know where they were, but we often talk about how we we didn't die. So <laughs> what kills you makes you stronger. So on that, so it's you, it's Faith, it's St Stanley and Stacy. They yeah. were the the twins, and my my uh, the, their birth story because we're going to talk about birth stories in the next episode is that my mother thought she was only having one baby. And so my sister was born, Phyllis Stacy uh, Thomas. And then they said, oh, there's another one. And my brother was born at the time with a blue arm is what they said. This arm is of his is totally freckled now. I mean, it's freckled the whole arm, but it was blue. And my mother was um, very upset, and the doctor said, would you rather him have been born with no arm? Mm -hmm. And so that ended that. They were, um, we always called them by their middle names. I don't know why, but their first names disappeared. They were always known by their middle names. My sister, Stacy, I always describe her, if we went right, she went left. <laughs> if, if we went left, she went right. So... We were the ones that did all the things that were, we were expected to do, and she was just different. On the other hand, in town, she's the one that everybody knows. They knew her as the friendly person, the outgoing person, the pleasant person, that she had the best singing voice, as mm -hmm. my two younger sisters do. We all grew up in the same church, but if you ask people around town, they say they didn't know anybody existed except Stacy. Hmm. And so she was everybody's friend. She was the person that everyone knew because she had the big personality. She was the athlete, but she was also the one that you'd look up and my mother would be at the school and we would all say, oh, what did Stacy do again? Because <laughs> there's mommy dressed to the nines up at the school because if you were wrong she was going to get you but if the teachers were wrong she was going to get them so it was okay what is fierce she do? advocate for her children a absolutely. absolutely my brother is the athlete he's the runner he's the tennis player he is all of he's just been in the newspaper as being yeah. a certified personal trainer my brother is the swimmer. He's the triathlete Iron of the man, family. Iron all man, the all that stuff. So I told him, never stop running, never stop walking. Keep doing what you're doing because the rest of us have high blood pressure, diabetes. My brother is in the best shape going. And so he is the per he's the handy person. He gathered those skills from my father. Mm -hmm. He can fix cars. He can fix things. Might I take him a while, but he will do well, it. <laughs> yeah, he, he takes a minute. But that that is my my brother. But you know, my sister was a nurse. My my brother got his degree later, but he got a dual degree yes. in criminal justice and mining engineering because he he worked in the mines for a while, too. And he's an incredible artist. He's an incredible artist. Yes. I have some of his um, uh, drawings from when he was taking art classes in school when, you know, you're in a class and you've just done so many pieces of art, where does it all go? And he gave me some of his drawings as well as some of his old materials, and I still have them in my home. 
my um, two younger sisters. My sister Carla was also in the military. She mm -hmm. was in the Air Force. So she was ranked in the Air Force. She is educated in, in child care, came out of the, the military and, and worked for the post office for a while. So she worked for the federal government. My sister Carla, you would describe how, Raina? It's the most bubbly, friendly, sweet person. Can't drive. I don't think she can drive. But <laughs> she's she's going to be mad when no, she no, hears that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just... We I, all I say like that. Life. <laughs> we all say that. <laughs> but one of the most loving and sweet and bubbly. She's got like this. She does everything. She's she'll be in like the yoga class, and then the next moment she'll be gardening in her garden, and she'll tell you all about the big tomatoes that she just grew. And then she's she's everywhere. Um, so I have such a, uh, every time I think about my aunt Carla Ray, I think I, I have a big smile on my face. She's the person that if she thinks it, she says it. Yes. So my sister Carla is she she doesn't hold back. She's she's very honest and and you have to laugh when you're around her because she exudes a lot of joy, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of joy. Absolutely. And my youngest sister, uh, the Dust Reverend, she's the Reverend. There are people who, for some reason, will mistakenly, instead of calling me doctor, call me reverend. And I always say, no, no, that's the other one. <laughs> <laughs> so Lily is a reverend. Um, and the um, fiercest advocate for family. I Absolutely. said, if I ever was ill and needed an advocate, I would want it to be my sister, be my sister Benita Lee. Because when my one sister was ill, and we had to call doctor's offices and people to coordinate services, I took the back seat. I was on the calls. And so I know that if I ever had the need for an advocate, I would want it to be Lily. She spent her uh, career in government, so she has one of those clearances that are real high up there. There is occasions when we would say, where do you actually work? And she would say, if I tell you, I have to kill you. <laughs> so, so she has one of those kind of clearances and has worked in the government, got her degree later in life, but she both had her master's and bachelor's. So uh, my older sister, Renee, I didn't mention that she spent her career as a supervisor working for Philip Morris in Virginia. So everyone's had their long careers. Mm -hmm. Some graduated from school, some did not, but uh, were always, always very hard workers. All of us left town at some point. We were there. It seems like a lot of the young people now want to stay home and stay with their parents or <laughs> live there, but... Not us. We wanted to go and explore the world. So, Although you came back for a good while. Um, I, to, I came back for a job. Yes, you came back for a job for, good, to, for a good while in Uniontown. My and brother, um, yep. Stanley, came back. He, he was in Virginia for a while and then went to San Francisco. Came back right after the big earthquake in 1990, but it coincided with my dad being ill. And so the earthquake was the impetus to get him out of town, but it was the uh, blessing in a way because in terms of him being pushed to come back to town to help take care of my dad because he was living with my dad when he died. Yeah. And then Aunt Faith also, um, you know, she went to nursing school and lived in Uniontown for a while within her the, her early career. So yeah, she's the other one that people occasionally mix her and me up. So they, when I would come home from wherever I was, people would run up to me and hug me, <laughs> and I would look at these people saying, "Who the heck are you?" And they would say, "You were so good to me in the hospital," and I would be, "Oh, that's the other one. <laughs> that's my sister." So, yeah, she worked in town for uh, a brief period before she went into the military. She decided she wanted a different career, so she was Navy, Carla was Air Force. Well, one of the things I want to emphasize, too, in the, these stories is around the interconnectedness of family that you all travel together, that even when um, Grandma um, transitioned and when Grandpa also transitioned, and that was its own story of um, him dying only one day after Aunt Stacy, two different states, two different causes. 
and the devastation of that. Um, but such grief and and difficulty can lead to family strain, and that never happened in our family. We, I can say, I don't know that we've had any serious arguments. I mean, nothing that I can speak of. Yeah, there are things we don't agree on, but but there has never been any kind of serious disagreement, any kind of harsh words. We are such close-knit people that I think others are mm. remark about that. That even Where do you think that that came from? Oh, I don't know. We were we especially this the six of us who grew up together. I mean, we did not have a lot. The, the youngest two often say, Nor my one sister said, Norma, were we really poor? <laughs> because by the time they were growing up, my mother had gone back to work. So that eased some of the economic strain on the family. But, yeah, we were poor folks. And you had to rely on each other. But we had a big extended family. Mm. We were all, all, all of us were just very, very close. And there was no discussion about having harsh words or disagreements that would wind up with you not speaking to one of your siblings. We just never, never, ever, ever had that. And hopefully we never will. Yeah, I, I think that that's something unique too. Um, that is a great gift that you have passed on to me and, and my brother. And also from Papi's side of the family um, too, this connectedness of family, that family is what you have, is all that you have. Um, and that being so important. And when I was growing up, we went back to Uniontown all the time, one when because my grandfather was there. But when he wasn't, we still went back to Uniontown. That was where you were from. And having visits to the, the Thomas Family Cemetery and um, going to see um, the East End United Community Center, which, you know, Grandmom helped to start. Um, if there was an event, for example, at one point, Aunt Renee was going to a big mega church in Richmond, and she invited us to go down for Easter. Everybody gathered with their kids and went to Easter service for a few years with her. The family gathers. When one person calls, the family gathers. And, and that is so significant to me as I start to think about the future for my family will most likely be returning to Italy because that's where my husband is from. And I have definitely been emphasizing making sure that my children have these opportunities to be immersed within our, our community, our family, and to have the close connections of hearing um, Lily tell everybody what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and Renee feed us so well and also tell uh, us what to do. <laughs> and you tell us what to do. Everybody wants to tell everybody what I, to do. I think <laughs> all of us would describe each other as being, uh, uh, hmm, what, what's the word? I don't want to use the word that is very sexist, which is bossy. Not but bossy. <laughs> um, a, a leader, a, assertive perhaps. Assertive. Yes. We're all very assertive. We're all very assertive. I think the, the least. Definitive leaders. The <laughs> least assertive are people like Faith and, and Stanley. Uh, but But the rest of us, at least we bear it all outward. But I yes. would, I'm sure if you talk to people from both of their work experiences, mm -hmm. Faith was a supervisor, a charge nurse. My brother was a supervisor in the mines. We all raised to those kinds of supervisory positions. Renee was a supervisor. Lily was a supervisor. Carla was, you know, worked in the post office and was a officer. So in everybody the Air is Force. very strong in their vision. <laughs> so, and I think that that's a gr a great gift as well to have raised grandpa and grandma and the community around y'all raised you to be clear in your vision and to be leaders, right? But I think that also is a trait that was passed down from mm -hmm. my mother yeah. who who was a woman who would never have cursed anyone out. Mm. 
mm. uh, ever, because I'm not sure I ever heard my mother use a curse word in her life. But if she blessed you down, Ooh. you knew that you had been uh, faced with somebody who was a force to be reckoned with. Nobody would mess with my mother, especially when it came to her children. So we we received that gift of leadership from her. Yeah. Well, and as coming back to my babies, right, I'm, I'm planning on co going to, with you to the calendar party at the East End United Community Center in a yes, few weeks. Yes, I've let them know that, yes, actually. Yes, I'm, I'm bringing the babies. They're going to be a havoc for sure. Um, but it's important for me and for them to know where our people come from. And no matter where they go in the world, they are rooted. They are connected to our people and to know where our people are. So talk to your siblings about stories because you remember things differently from, from what they do. We, we do that all the time. Oh, that didn't happen. Yes, it did. It really <laughs> did happen. So we, we hear those stories. We talk about those stories. We live in, in, although we're pretty close in age, there's still that gap. And so what was going on in the world is different for all of us, too. And it's good to share those stories, make sure we all are connected. And please connect with your family as much as you can because when they're gone, they're gone. Yes. And you you don't want to have time of regret. You want to have time of joy and not mourn what you didn't do or could have done. Yes. And part of that, too, is, is an inspiration for us, these conversations where we've been talking about going back for that calendar party and spending some time with my Uncle Stanley and looking at the photographs that he has to record them, to talk about the memories and the people who are noted within it, uh, within those albums, and to share what we learn. Again, I can't say enough, as I know I do <laughs> every time, but what you learn, share what you learn. And, and that is how the memories of our people will continue far into the future. So I thank you so much for joining us again in, the, um, in this virtual living room, perhaps, where you, we welcomed you into our family. And I hope that this leads you into a great understanding of your people, maybe biological, maybe through lineage of idea, but you are important. Your people deserve and demand archive. And I hope that you are able to recover the stories that give you strength and wisdom and healing and whatever it is that you need within this moment when you call the ancestors respond. So thank you again for listening to Generational Archives. Please like and subscribe. And you can also support us on Patreon. Just look for us um, as Generational Archives. And we, again, deeply appreciate you joining us and listening. Bye. Bye-bye.